So it's two o'clock. Uh, uh, let's start. Um, I'm Jean-Marc Mangin, uh, the president and CEO of the Philanthropic Foundations of Canada. I'm very pleased to welcome our, our panelists today. The, uh, the, uh, we are, uh, uh, for those of you that attended the, our first webinar a month ago, uh, the, we had the kind of the what are we in uh, for and, and, and what's the, the, the first line of response. And we thought it would be uh, a good moment a month in to check in where we are in this crisis. We, we also have an amazing group of panelists. Several of them were on the first panel uh, a month ago. So I'd like to introduce them briefly. And then uh, I've got a series of questions to ask them. And we'll engage in a conversation. And then we'll engage you to ask a question through, um, through the chat box. Uh, to, to, to the panelists for over, over the next hour. Uh, so it's a, so it's a, a fairly informal uh, setting. Les, la, les, les présentations, les discussions se font surtout en anglais, mais n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions en français. La majorité de nos panélistes, à l'exception de Sharon, sont parfaitement bilingues. Donc, euh, n'hésitez pas à de poser la question, vos questions, vos commentaires dans la langue de votre choix. Donc, uh, uh, let me introduce our, 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 our panelists today. We have Claire Trottier uh, from, uh, from McGill University, but also from the Trottier Family Foundation. Uh, Conrad Sauvé, the president of the Canadian Red Cross Society of Canada. Uh, Sharon Avery, pre president of the Toronto Foundation. Uh, Marcel Lozier, uh, president of Lawson Foundation. And uh, that's our, 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 our panelists today. So our, my first question, and I'll direct that to, uh, to Conrad. What so far in the response, what is working, but also what is not working? Uh, thank you, Jean-Marc. Uh, I think the, uh, what's working, and, and I'd say what's challenging right now for the uh, Red Cross, certainly what's working is the fact that we've been involved in emergency responses in Canada in the last number of years, unfortunately, of course, but, uh, and mainly the massive response support MAC, where we helped some 80,000 Canadians so what's been working for us has been the, we put in tools that enabled us to go to scale, uh, mass cash assistance, uh, for example, call centers and so on. Again, to go be able to go to scale, the challenge for us in this moment is that scale, the size of that scale. So at this point we are, we have registered 240,000 Canadians. So we're catching up again with the technology, but the thresholds are very high. Uh, the other thing that's really worked well for us, actually, is that we have deployed internationally and we have an expertise in uh, mobile, field, uh, mobile field hospitals and we have uh, run uh, both Ebola and cholera clinics internationally. And we repatriated that expertise for this response, use that expertise to manage the quarantine centers and build up a little bit the whole safety protocols around that PPE equipment and so on and so forth. So that, that has worked uh, really well um, in helping us develop the, uh, the safe responses in Canada. Uh, the challenges uh, were in the dealing with nine federal uh, agencies. I think the things we have not managed to do uh, following the big disasters that were on our list were of course, funding preparedness. Uh, we did not manage to get a lot of funds on that side, uh, funding the technology, um, and also uh, creating uh, agile funding models that allow uh, fast disbursement. We're still in the model a little bit. The bureaucracy has to shift from not creating uh, funding models where the expected outcomes in a situation that's very volatile uh, can be always clearly defined. But to give you a bit of an example in terms of the size of our operations, we've already spent uh, up to $40 million and not, we have not received a, a, an amount, any kind of amount yet from public authorities. So th those tools are not quite in place yet to deal with this type of event. Thank you, Conrad, for that uh, national overview from the Canary Red Cross. Sharon, can I ask you in terms of a, of a, a more local to Toronto-based perspective of what's working and what's not working? I was just reflecting on um, how relieved I am to no longer be part of UNICEF at this time and the bigness and the scale and the, um, the 
many levels of decision making, Conrad, you have to face on uh, in an emergency like this. But it's interesting because it certainly have brought um, some of that thinking to the work at the community foundation level, which is hyper local. Um, and I would say what we are worried about from a challenge standpoint um, is vulnerable populations and uh, connected to that in this emergency vulnerable organizations. So there's a, there's a real um, sort of multi dimension to this crisis where you've got uh, the most vulnerable populations being served by the most vulnerable uh, small sized, we, we, we support small medium sized orgs working on um, the intractable problems in Toronto and um, you know, they are struggling to stay open. They are struggling to um, uh, serve an increased volume of uh, clients and, um, and uh, are, are, are sort of largely outside of most of the um, bailout uh, funding that is available, or it's just highly complex for them to stop what they're doing and, and get involved. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge we're facing. What's working for us as a community foundation, you know, it is a matter of how to, uh, whether to get involved, but how. Um, and we had the experience a few years ago, um, tragic experience of being deeply involved in the Toronto Strong campaign uh, with the city. And so a lot of the groundwork we laid there, uh, even for a staff of a community foundation, which typically don't get involved in uh, crisis, um, has served us really well um, in, in terms of shifting gears for this. The difference with this emergency for all of us, I think, um, on this call uh, and anyone who is, is participating in the funding environment is the protracted nature and the constant change of this emergency. And for community foundations can be a bit old fashioned at times. And, uh, and so being able to be nimble and um, offering up funds in an unrestricted and fast response way isn't typically part of our DNA. And so you're seeing us all across the country adapting very quickly to that new environment. And I think rising to the occasion in, in, in most cases, but, um, but it's a challenge. Right, uh, thanks Sharon. Uh, yeah, and and uh, both Claire and Marcel as, as uh, in being involved in, in, in Family Foundation, you, you both have a, a leg in a kind of local response, but then again, trying to keep a, a pan kind of national perspective from your perspective, from your, from where you're sitting. So what's working and not working? Maybe I'll start with Claire. Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, I, I wear different hats. So I definitely wear the, uh, the, the Chatsi Family Foundation hat, which is a private foundation. Um, and I also am a professor at McGill with a background in virology. Um, and, and involve some other organizations. So um, one of the things I think that you know, to Sharon's point about, you know, these smaller organizations that are struggling um, and, and trying to find ways to act in new ways that, that aren't necessarily our, 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 our standard operating procedure. I think that that's one of the opportunities here um, as we move forward to try to find new ways of uh, working together um, in particular in a crisis situation that um, most of us, aside from, I guess, Conrad, uh, don't have a lot of experience dealing with crisis situations. Um, so one of the, the new things that has emerged that I've been involved with, um, a few um, Quebec-based foundations um, had been having some conversations and um, we had collectively identified a need of um, having a way to support um, collaboration amongst these foundations um, to be able to respond to various needs across sectors um, and um, also have some insight on crisis management. Um, so we've actually gotten together and are in the process of hiring somebody to help us um, facilitate better collaboration amongst uh, foundations and various actors in Quebec with the intention of having it be very open and um, uh, flexible uh, to be used by the community as a whole uh, to try to move and act um, based on, on different needs on the ground um, and to bring a little bit of like a crisis management um, perspective to to this situation, which you know, as a as a family foundation with a small staff, we don't really um, have the expertise or the capacity to to do so. Um, so that's one thing that I, I'm hopeful that it's going to help meet a, a need that we've seen um, and and help make things work better. Um, but certainly, I've seen a lot of people act 
quite quickly and 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 nimbly and and um, in ways that are outside of our normal way of functioning. Um, and I think that uh, hopefully we can see more and more foundations taking that kind of risk uh, moving forward. Great, Claire. I'd like to go back to that point of collaboration, both at national level and local level, a, a bit later in our conversation. Uh, Marcel, can we bring you in? What's working uh, not working? Yeah, maybe the first thing I'd say um, is looking at how fast a number of foundations, of course, including those on the call today, have moved uh, on this. I think that's been really encouraging. I wasn't really in the foundation world in 2008, 2009 during the financial crisis, but I was at Imagine Canada at that point. And I had a feeling that more foundations were retrenching. Um, there are less foundations willing to come out and really do something really quickly. And while I don't have any numbers, and maybe you're starting to see some of, no, of those numbers, I'm not, I have a sense that foundations are out there much more now than they were, you know, 2008, 2009. So that for me is really, really encouraging. Um, it, like pretty much every foundation, we've had to move to virtual working. Hasn't been a big issue for us because we mostly work virtually anyhow. So that the transition, I think it was easier for us maybe to move fast. But we also did recognize that, um, well, a bit like Sharon was saying, sometimes we can be dinosaurs in our, in our environment. And we actually don't do direct deposit to our grantees. And we realized that, you know, being quick and sending checks out by courier, courier across the country is probably not the best way to go. Not agile, as, as, as Conrad was saying. So that's something we've learned and we're going to have to look at, um, look at improving. One thing that was really easy for us to do, and many others have done the same thing, is write to all of our grantees and say, listen, use your funds in an unrestricted way. Don't worry about reporting. We'll give you advanced payments. That was the easy stuff. Uh, it's got, it started getting more difficult when we wanted to get out, out across the country and get a sense very quickly what the needs were. I mean, we don't, we're not agile in that, in that same way. Um, so we create communities across the country very quickly and that, that helped us do, there, to do that. But I think as foundations, we're gonna have to learn to be much more agile and live with uncertainty. Um, you know, I would say, you know, we always like to be, I think, where the puck is going rather than where, where the puck is. And in this particular situation, that's really, really hard. Um, so trying to understand the national picture, and as people know, Quebec and Ontario are very different than, than the Maritimes or out west. So trying to figure that one out has been very difficult also. Although I guess would be some of the challenges and the, uh, and the opportunities that I, I found thus far. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, here at PFC, I've been very lucky to, to hear from many of our members across the country, and, and, and I, 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 I do get a sense they are stepping up, and not like 2008, 2009, with some, some were retrenching uh, in the middle of the crisis. Um, the, the, we, we uh, along with CFC, EFC, and Circle, released five guiding principles to help foundation in their journey to respond to the, to the, to the crisis. And I've heard from several of our members that they've used these principles in their board discussion in terms of framing what needs to be done now, what needs to be done later. Uh, and and uh, we're going to be launching a survey to, because we can't wait for a normal CIA reporting to come back and to tell us a, a couple of years from now what, we, uh, what we're doing. So we are going to be launching a, a, a survey in the coming days. And uh, with thanks to the pro bono work of Grand Book, we're building a, a, a platform to capture that information, to help with the analysis and disseminate it back to our broad community. So we know who's doing what with whom uh, and, uh, and where, <laughs> and the mechanisms of, of working. So impact that information more broadly to, 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 to community and support uh, provincial coordination efforts like the one that Claire was mentioning in Quebec. And um, the Trillium Foundation, ONN, is also working on developing something for Ontario. So supporting regional mechanisms for, uh, by providing that open, open path platform where that information be readily available. So thank you for, for uh, going through that first round of question. Uh, I'd like to, to um, push you on in terms of as your work evolve in the last month. It's at the end. And what have you learned so far uh, and that, that you need to, in, that you may not have yet integrated in the operation, but you've realized that these, these are, these are uh, Marcel was mentioning one example of, of, of the checks, but they, what is on a, on a big, on a, on a kind of big perspective, on a small perspective, what have you kind of key lessons? I know we have been busy and I have much time for, 
for reflection. But uh, at, at three o'clock at night, you wake up and say, eh, we forgot to do this, or I've learned to do that. Uh, and, and so what's, what have you learned per, per, in, in that journey over the last month? Conrad, you're on mute. Thanks, uh, Jean-Marc. I, you know, I, I, I hate to say I'm going to come back to the theme of what we've learned internationally in terms of large events, because a lot of these things apply uh, to a certain point. And we're going to come back to it a little bit later from uh, the initial discussion on, on the length of recovery as well in this operation. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, the, uh, we've seen it in recent operations, the, the ability to use uh, uh, technology and support local operations as well. I think we're looking at large scale and local. Certainly we've launched a virtual operations center in Toronto working with the food banks to make sure that food is delivered to those who can't make it to the food banks, for example. So I think new partnerships in terms of working local is uh, one of the key things. But one of the most important things we found internationally in our both our cholera but our Ebola experience in West Africa is that, and what we're seeing now is that it's often at the community level at the weakest link where uh, the challenges are. And I think that touches on what uh, Sharon was saying earlier. Um, you know, the, and we're seeing at this, at this point, a lot of conversation was about acute care hospitals and IC unit units, and we have not strengthened enough the, uh, the uh, long-term care and care of aging in the community where it's a, uh, where we're seeing the cases come up now. And I think this is a learning in terms of the immediate response, you're as strong as your weakest link, and you need to strengthen that. And again, the experience we've had from international that we're trying to bring here, and that I raised at the last meeting as well, is appropriate training. It's gonna become more and more important that anybody who is client facing has the appropriate training and has the appropriate equipment to be able to do that. So we've taken a leadership role on that set, at that level, at the federal level. I'm glad we brought that in because the community was nowhere in the priorities of PPE purchasing and so on in a centralized fashion. So we're taking on that role and we're purchasing massively for community organizations as well uh, that will need this and also rolling out a training at that level. Because again, when we, even when we go back to a certain normalcy, how are we gonna be protecting ourselves? And again, the message of volunteering, please volunteer, but at the same time, stay safe. There's a bit of a mixed message there if you're not appropriately trained, appropriately equipped and comfortable in those situations. So I think this is one of the lessons uh, we've learned and that we're applying and that shows true here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Conrad. I mean, the, I was struck today with the, the Premier of Quebec's uh, daily conference, making a call for specialist doctors to go in an old age home because they're lacking uh, trained professional and trained volunteers to go in uh, and, and, and support some of the most vulnerable community when most of the, the deaths are, are appearing. Uh, Sharon, do, do, do you want to, in terms of what's, hap what's happening on your, your front, in terms of what have you learned so far? Well, I, I, I totally resonate with some of the, the technological challenges that were cited in the last round. And, and I'll just uh, put a call out. Uh, our finance team, we were writing checks up until March 14th uh, as well. We hadn't moved to electronic transfer. And we partnered with Canada Helps. And Canada Helps had us turned around in a week um, because, of course, they already have the electronic banking information for 20 or 30,000 uh, small charities. So if that's of service to anyone on this uh, webinar, we found that uh, fabulous. And that's really gotten our money moving faster. Um, I don't know if it will be our ultimate long-term solution, but boy, has it been a fantastic um, short-term solution. And I will say, um, it just for me ex exemplifies that one of our lessons has been the importance of being good partners before the emergency. Um, because we have had to call on partners, including our banking partners, including um, other uh, private foundations. We're partnering with more private foundations in this emergency than I think we ever have. And I think it's, it's been a lot of hard work um, showing ourselves as good partners and uh, it's paying off in the emergency. And I hope that it is one of the things that, that um, really is one of the after effects um, so modernization from a technological standpoint was one of our early lessons and one of the things that has evolved dramatically for us. 
Um, and then on the other side, on the funding side and on our relationships with the sector, I think um, one of the things that we implemented in the first week was a weekly webinar to bring together funders and organizations right away as equals in this problem um, and giving voice to some of these vulnerable organizations direct to funders. And so we've had consistently a couple of hundred folks tomorrow doing it on race. Last week we covered gender and COVID and that has been um, an evolving project. We've not done anything really like that before um, and it has been so well received and I'm really happy to see the consistency of attendance um, between uh, it's about 50% uh, funders, 50% orgs and, they're, and the ex exchanges they're having in chat and the volunteer stuff that's coming out afterwards, the gift in kind and the cash um, has been really, really useful. And it's made us stop and think about all the face-to-face -face work we've done for years as a community foundation and how much more we're going to probably do uh, virtually in the future and how much more efficient it is. So I think that's what I would contribute at this point. I think there's lots more lessons um, we, we are always trying to apply what we learn right away, but those are probably the big ones that are continuing to evolve right now. Yeah, I, I, I listened into one of these uh, Thursday morning conversation that you you that you host, and I was struck by the energy and the openness and the the uh, generosity and people listening to 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 to, to one another. So it's a, in terms of a of a community gathering, is is uh, very striking. Uh, we, ha we have a couple of questions coming in, but let's, let's uh, do, the, do the finish the round before I get to those. So, Claire. Sure. I mean, I think that maybe I, I will um, offer some slightly different reflections in terms of learnings. I think for me, um, one of the things that's, that's clear, I mean, I think building on the idea of partnerships and relationships, but I also think that um, understanding where people are at in their thinking about this crisis and 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 how they see things evolving i think um different people are perceiving the situation differently and uh, have a, a different sense of how long this is going to last and what the exit strategy might look like um, and i think that for me it's been helpful to get a sense of where people are at on that level of understanding because that influences a lot of how people are engaging on these issues um, and I think that um, that kind of goes to a lot of the core of what we're facing with as a community. Because um, in, my, in my view, and I think in a lot of other expert views, um, this is something that's going to be a very, very long-term problem. Um, there was an excellent piece just published this week in The Atlantic by Ed Young, who's a fantastic science writer. Uh, and he quotes uh, Michael Osterholm, who's a, an, a, an infectious disease specialist at the University of Minnesota, um, basically saying that... Um, you know, uh, some people think this is something that's going to be over in a few weeks, but really it's something that might stretch into two years. This is sort of a paraphrasing. And I think that's a very difficult um, and heavy realization. Um, and I, and I, there's no crystal ball. We don't know how long this is going to last, but it's certainly, I think, important for us as a community to start grappling with, with, with the length of time we might be in, in some version of what we're in now. And what does that mean for all of these small organizations, for our organizations, for how we are going to support all of us through this, finding an exit strategy out of this, um, and then whatever comes after. Um, so I think for me, the, the big learning is like, take a minute and try to see like where people are at and how they're, they're, they're conceptualizing this crisis. Um, because I think that it's important to have those conversations to help frame how we can work together. Marcel, two more years of this. Uh, are we learning fast enough to uh, to maintain uh, the, 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 the the appropriate response? Well, it's it's interesting what you just said, Claire. I think you really hit it on the nail. That's what I was trying to say in my say in my first comment, but you said it more eloquently. Try to figure out where things are going to be and how people are thinking about this and where people are going to be, and then where are where should we be as foundations? I think that's a huge huge challenge. Um, much more granular. Um, that was a great idea, Sharon, to go to Canada Helps. We finally found a way to do it. Um, it wasn't easy. I never thought of going to Canada Helps. That would have been a great partnership, in fact. And, and certainly, like you who are working with private foundations, we're working also with community foundations that 
developed a partnership with the London Community Foundation. So that's a new way for us to, to work also. But the biggest learning for us is, I guess, we're quite a focused on healthy development of children and youth, and we mostly work at the systems level and do public policy and try to change things for the long term. And this year, because of what's happening, we've redeployed all of our funding towards, you know, frontline uh, work around COVID-19, food banks, homeless shelters, women's shelters, youth mental health support for seniors, et cetera, things that we don't normally do. Um, and that's been, that's been really interesting for us to figure out how you do that and how you do it in a way that it's community driven without applications because you want the dollars out the door really quickly. The thing that it's making me think, and maybe I can talk a, or talk a bit about it later on, is how, how do foundations, or at least our foundation, find the right balance between the importance of doing the systems work, which I, we really believe in, but also not forgetting you know, the work on the ground that, and the needs that are there day in and day out. And I think many foundations, including Lawson, maybe have moved away from that. Um, and, and I think we have to rethink what the balance is there and, and part of how, you know, what's our role in the ecosystem in helping those organizations on the ground. So that's going to make us think quite a bit. And lastly, and I'll come back to it later also, is just working virtually and working through Zoom with our board and with our grantees, et cetera, is telling me that we have to think about how we're going to vir work virtually much better than we have. You know, less travel, less, 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 especially for an organization that works across the country. I think there are ways of better connecting with our grantees, et cetera. So I think there are big learnings. We're just starting to figure out what those are going to be. Okay. Uh, th thanks, to, thanks to all of you, and, and thanks to uh, Conrad to address some of the questions we got from Florian from uh, how to address the safety needs of volunteers and staff and, and whether or not the, um, the funders are open to, to, uh, to support these kind of, uh, of expenditures. Uh, and and from, my, from my conversation with the, the uh, with foundation, they def definitely are in terms of much more open to Support kind of expenditures that, that were not that were, that were not there before, uh, and, and and safety being paramount. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's and the way to do it in a in a in in, in a, a more systematic systematic way with, with standards around the safety training. The point that Conrad 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 was raising. So thanks for uh, Conrad and, and the folks at the Red Cross to answer the question in in real time as it came out. But that's that's the the point that Marcel was speaking about. Still working on the system change approach has been kind of the where many foundations have been moving out towards in recent times, and then we got this immediate response where there's real real need real need right now. But there was an ONN report released late last week that showed that the twenty percent of uh, not for profit in Ontario have already closed uh, suspended the operation, and uh, for, for the remaining the the, the bulk of that of them don't have resources for, for uh, past the next two months. And as Claire's mentioned, this crisis is gonna be with us for quite some time. So uh, maybe I can ask to take, to take that to move to my next question says, uh, have there been any unexpected or unintended developments in your work? And uh, perhaps uh, Conrad, can you start? Again? Yes. Uh I, I like to. Uh, I think. I think there's a, there's a bit, but I mean, it's. I. It's something we've talked about a lot for a long time. But we have been uh, funding the uh, the international uh, sector, supporting countries uh, respond to crisis for, uh, for for God knows how many years. Um, I didn't. We talked about it, but I didn't expect it. So we are managing the donation side to Canada as well on behalf of the Canadian government. So we are receiving quite uh, a substantial amount of. Uh, um, gifts in kind in terms of uh, protective equipment for the health sector from uh, China and Taiwan and managing that. So this is a new thing, as well as we've organized uh, direct conferences, and you've talked about technology between uh, frontline workers and uh, public health officials in China and in, um, in Italy with Canadian health officials and frontline workers as well to exchange in real-time practices. So I think the positive sides of we know there's gonna be challenges in globalization, but there's some positives as well. I think the other part, I think one of the themes here, and, and I'm gonna go back on what Claire talked about is there's the emergency phase as well that is uh, critical that we're talking about. Uh, again, our experience is the recovery is gonna be much more complex and long as well. 
just on, on big emergencies, we're talking about five years and psychosocial support is gonna be critical. So when we're talking to like foundations, like many of them here, there's a temptation to want to solve everything and be right on the front line. Um, there needs to be uh, some time and some resources left for the recovery as well. Um, and, and really not uh, understating the importance of psychosocial issues that are, are, are around and are gonna be there for some time. Do you want me to dive in, Jean? Yeah, dive, dive in, Sharon, and then, and then Claire again. Yeah. So I guess um, maybe a twist on your question that has come up uh, in the last week or so, kind of connected to what Conrad just said is, I, I think that, so this is my first, I, I guess I'm three and a half years in as a funder, um, and really having to make this decision about timing. I think one of the biggest challenges is, is this question as Claire articulated about how much to do right away, how much to, do, to hold a little dry powder for uh, stabilization and recovery. And in an environment locally that isn't used to protracted emergencies, um, that's a really hard call to make. And I, especially when in, in an emergency environment, the sort of theory is don't, you don't wanna regret anything. You wanna get everything going. You, wanna, you don't wanna leave anything on the table. And yet, we do want to leave something on the table. So this is a this is the sort of conversation um, my board has been having uh, for the last week or so. But the other piece of it, on the bright side, is all of the positive that is coming out of the community and out of government uh, in terms of making decisions to do things that it has felt like government has fought against for a really long time. And uh, in terms of things like, well, what if something that might come out of this might be something like, um, uh, you know, a, a living wage or, you know, and so when are we going to start that conversation as funders and as collaborators? And, um, and well, there's still, because we seem to have short memories as, as um, humans. And I, you know, I look at, at 2008 in so, some ways for the sector feels like it was a lost opportunity. And yet I feel in some ways, this emergency is a great opportunity, but how many of us have the time and the money and the energy to spend any time on that right now is a question I, I'm starting to have and, and we're starting to talk about um, at CFC, at Community Foundations of Canada and, and beyond. And so I think it's a really unexpected, um, you know, at the beginning of this, we were all just adjusting to our new lives, but now I'm wondering if, if there's an opportunity here for us to build on what the the planet, what the country, what government has learned um, recently. Yeah, yeah, Sharon, your point reminds me that the in the First World War, uh, income tax was introduced as a temporary measure in 1917. Uh, so I'm wondering if the, the the income support program that we see seeing now that are, are meant to be temporary, it's part of the title might be around for longer than we think. But uh, you, you need a policy intent to make sure that, that that happens. Claire. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the unintended consequences or unintended um, uh, things that are happening, you know, personally, I'm, I'm involved in more conversations than I normally would participate in from a philanthropic standpoint. I'm on the board of our family foundation um, and I'm now finding myself much more involved in trying to get the ball rolling on a couple of different things. Um, and um, in terms of opportunities that present themselves, I think this idea of um, deepening relationships that were pre-existing and also forging new relationships and finding ways to work together in, in new ways, and in, in some cases slightly outside our traditional missions, um, I think that that is a net positive. I think that that's something that can hopefully be sustained and deepened. Um, I think working, um, in a in a more collaborative way where we're supporting each other and we have a better uh, sense of what each other is doing to support the system, especially with this sort of like multi-stage process that we're undergoing now, um, that I think that we have a responsibility to do so in order to be able to effectively support our communities. Um, so I think that that's a maybe an un unintended consequence of this crisis. And I think it's a positive unintended consequence and hopefully will be sustained over the long term. 
Marcel, anything to add? <clears throat> yeah, just to, to, to your point, Sharon, around 2008, 2009, how it was a missed opportunity. All naive because even in those years we were saying everything's going to change, you know, it will not be the same world. And we came out and it's pretty much exactly the same world. Um, so my hope is that that will not be the case this time. And what, what's the role of foundations on up front? Not on our own, of course, but working with governments and, and working with our grantees. So, so many of them are thinking about the same thing about how they're working not only reorganize themselves, but actually rethink their role. I'm very involved as a volunteer with the YMCA movement, for example, and those conversations are starting to happen on that front also. And that's going to be tough. And who's going to give people the time to do it and the resources to do it? So that's something that I think we need to, we need to be thinking, thinking about. One thing that just a small thing that, that we learned from this process on even if it's only early days, is even though we're a small team, we're actually all working outside of our silos. Everyone is just rolling up their sleeves and doing something, which actually includes our board members. You know, we have a very governance uh, board, um, but in this case here, all the board members are out there in community and working with us. So that's been very, very exciting. And I think a lot of nonprofits are realizing the same thing. So it's nice to have that connection to our grantees in terms of the real world. Thanks. I, I've received a, you know, an anonymous question, uh, and I invite everybody to to keep asking the question on uh, on the chat. But uh, I'll ask the the, the 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 panelists this question: Is that the current crisis reveals and magnifies systemic issues and inequalities? Some populations are more vulnerable because of the combination of the crisis and those systemic issues. What is your approach? to address these, those systemic issues efficiently in your granting or in your work in the case of, of the, the, the Red Cross. So uh, who, can I ask Sharon to get started on this, on this round? Happy to. I think this is, uh, I had noted this was another unexpected conversation that is now a mainstream conversation or at least as mainstream as it's ever been is the amplification of inequality in this in this time and even as a funder um you know i feel privileged as an organization where my staff are going to keep their jobs and and we know it will be rough but we'll survive through this time um, and how we check our own privilege as a funder um, has been a question but I think what it looks like for us, as, as I said, we started it, with our first priority being to open a dialogue directly between uh, funders, donors, caring Torontonians, and the small, medium-sized organizations doing the messy work on the ground for COVID, um, and, and not for COVID. I, we had uh, um, the Massey Center on one of our um, webinars the other day, and you know they run home for adolescent pregnant girls. I mean, this is not a population anyone is talking about in this um, uh, in this crisis, and yet uh, could easily be forgotten. And so, for us, uh, uh, prioritizing lifting the voices of those organizations and making sure funders are aware they exist, and not just ex these are not just fly by night organizations. This is an organization that's been around for fifty plus years. So. Um, I think that's one of the examples of what we've been doing. We have been, we've been prioritizing rapid response, $10,000 undesignated grants as broadly as possible uh, in the last uh, two weeks and just trying to get money flowing without any restrictions, without any application, just straight out there to organizations. And what we've been doing is we started with our own um, pool of grantees and then we asked them, who should we also be granting to? and also sharing that, that, um, that power. I'm also proud to say that at least 20% of what we've invested so far has gone to indigenous urban, um, urban and indigenous led organizations in Toronto. And again, that is a population that would, you know, not be at the top of a lot of lists from a funding standpoint. And so for us, we felt it was really important um, uh, to get out and be supporting those organizations first. They're the ones dealing with the the smallest, uh, if any, reserves available to them. And, and you talked to Jean-Marc about that, you know, two to three week window ahead. We wanted to make sure that they could at least be paying their bills um, uh, as soon as possible. So that, those are sort of three examples from us 
of what we're doing to try and uh, directly deal with inequality. Marcel, you want to add from your perspective? Well, I would, we're working very much in the, this, the way that Sharon's describing, maybe what I would, and, and we're trying to do, I think, and certainly on the, on the indigenous front, and it also goes to the balance I was talking about earlier about how, what's the balance between very, very focused on particular communities and, and, and broader type of support, but the focus piece is coming, I guess, more in focus for us. But um, I was reading uh, a tweet from Myos Korak uh, recently, who's an economist that uh, I fo follow a lot. And I think he's the one who was saying, you know, people were saying this, this is the time of the, this is the great leveler. And he was saying it's not the great leveler, it's a great revealer. Uh, in terms of what's out there and the realities. And I think that is going to be a bit of a mantra for us going further in terms of thinking about what is this really revealing for us. Uh, Claire, before I move to, to Conrad. Sure, I mean, I think that, um, I think that's a really, really important question. And it's something that I, I struggled with long before this crisis hit and, and how to uh, reconcile the position of power that I sit in, um, somebody with great wealth sitting on a, you know, board of a family foundation, like I won the lottery of life, like who am I to make these decisions, right? Um, but um, in this particular crisis, the, the thing that I'm interested in, in seeing how we can engage in, and I think this is a, a complex question, but um, how can we support some of these um, non-qualified donees, some of these community organizations that in some cases have been around for a long time but don't have charitable status, and in some cases that are sort of springing up, you know, this, this care-mongering movement. Um, you know, we have sort of limited capacity to, to, um, to enter into like formal agreements with, you know, smaller groups, so how, how can we engage with this um, this type of initiative, I would I would really like to be able to, to find creative solutions. I understand PFC is organizing uh, a webinar on this later this month, um, mm -hmm. so I'll be really interested to hear what what is being proposed there. Um, and that's something that I'm hoping the this person we're we're hiring to to help us uh, with the Quebec response. Um, if if they could help try to tackle that as as part of their mandate, I think that would be a um, a a good way to, to try to get at that question, though, you know, an imperfect way and, and you know, we'll hopefully adjust and, and learn along, along this road. Thanks. And Conrad, the, the approach of the Canadian Red Cross to the most vulnerable and those we, we forget. Well, we've been uh, ramping up our whole response. I talked about our international teams, but our emergency health teams, our mobile capacity for First Nations, actually one of our biggest concern, of course, is the vulnerability of First Nation communities. So we're working with the uh, federal government and the provinces with that. And we've been responding to uh, multiple calls in terms of needs there, um, training, and also uh, having our standby equipment to be able to deploy rapidly. Unfortunately, we don't have enough equipment to cover the whole country. This is part of the uh, challenges of not having enough stockpile uh, nationally that, that we're going to try to address. We're also working, uh, especially in the west part of Montreal right now, in supporting uh, long-term care facilities. We've made some uh, proposals in terms of supporting the ones in crisis, uh, deploying personnel, helping up with the scale-up of uh, personnel as well. So we're on the front lines of those aspects, but I think I, I, I agree with the general comment that it reveals actually the, uh, the challenges, of the fragility and it's not equal uh, in, in terms of the response. So uh, we're very much into that. Um, just maybe a, a quick comment, uh, Claire, if any, uh, we have uh, extensive experience in dealing with non-qualified donees. Uh, we've set up a whole set of programs following both in Alberta and British Columbia. So if there's anybody who wants some information on that, we can share that, uh, how we set up the, uh, the financial assistance programs there. That, that would be very useful, Conrad. We'll, we'll follow up you on, on, on that specific. So a couple of things, as Claire mentioned, uh, next uh, webinar Wednesday uh, uh, at two o'clock, we'll address this, uh, this question of, of diversity, inclusion, and equity in the midst of a crisis. Uh, and so we have an exciting set of panelists to engage, uh, engage us on that. And uh, we're also working on organizing um, uh, webinar Wednesday on uh, Indigenous people in COVID-19 response. Uh, so they, they uh, in, in conjunction with the circle. 
So that uh, will probably take place in early May. We'll confirm that as soon as we can. And the, the greater question of, of um, uh, support to non-qualified donees, which uh, for those of you on, on, the, on this uh, webinar may recall, it was a, there are some specific recommendations from the Synes Committee last June to uh, review these rules. Uh, we're in conversation with the federal government and CRA to, to say at least we could, uh, to loosen up and suspend for the duration of the crisis. The, no decision has been taken so far. This is something that we'll be pursuing, we are pursuing ag uh, aggressively uh, so that we can unlock these resources going to those that are not set up uh, with a charitable number uh, much more easily. And that goes to the question that Florian just asked uh, uh, about uh, funding those are not the most famous organization. But I think we've addressed that in, in this last round of comments and that I can see the time is running. So let me go with the, the next question with, um, based on what we discussed already, what and where are the systems and funding gaps? And uh, do I, I'll mix it around and uh, start with Marcel this time. Okay, um, funding gaps. Um, one thing that we've been um, not concerned about, but the funding that we try to get out, we try not to duplicate what government is doing, or at least be as complementary as, uh, to government as we can. And it's been difficult because a number of announcements have been made, but as many know, the funds have not yet flowed. So that's a bit of a challenge for us. And I think in the future tells us, I think we have to have a better relationship with government. But one, one thing I'd like to talk very quickly about a bit of a pitch you for the foundations on the, on the call or on the webinar today, you will be seeing in the next few days, hopefully something called Give Five, the Give Five Pledge. Uh, we were saying earlier that the number of foundations that come forward in terms of the support they're giving in the time of COVID-19, I think it's better than it was last time, 2008, 2009. But there will be a challenge coming out sometime next week um, around getting private NQD foundations to go beyond the 3.5% disbursement quota and go at least a 5% and more. And hopefully a number of foundations across the country, a number of them are already doing it, no question about it, but many are still not doing it. And the hope will be that that will be a challenge to foundations who are not yet there to not retrench, but actually get out there and uh, use more of their assets than they would usually have uh, in recent years. So keep an eye out for that. It'll be called, I think, Give Five or something like that. Can I go next, Jean-Marc? Sorry, uh, Claire, do you want to continue? I'll, I'll let Sharon go ahead and I'll-, I'll uh, Okay, go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Sharon. Sorry, Sharon, go ahead. That's okay. I was just gonna say, I just wanna jump on Marcel's comment because I just heard about the Give Five and I'm taking it this week and I'm really excited about it. I think it's a great campaign. So I'll, I'll be quick and just say, I think um, for me, there's two questions. Uh, one, in terms of the immediate gaps, I just, I think food security is getting a lot of attention and well-deserved, but I wanna make sure people with disabilities, um, we've already talked about uh, indigenous populations, um, seniors, these are the ones we're really concerned about uh, right now. Um, and, uh, and then the question of kind of connected to what Claire was saying about non-qualified donees, but you know, advocates, advocacy, as I look at what recovery looks like, is there a role for us in funding more um, of the work that's happening to convince uh, for system, systems change? And, um, and how would we do that in this non donee status that so many advocates have, um, I think is a question that we have. And then I will just say, um, because I may not get another chance, that one group we haven't talked about at all is the arts and culture sector. Um, and it is weighing on me as a community foundation. Um, this is still a part of our grantee community and they, they have been shut down. They have no revenue. They have, and, and even though they aren't part of sort of the essentials of an emergency, they are essential to our culture and our, and our quality of life in the future. And when I think of the long tail of this emergency recovery, I wouldn't want to forget them uh, in that journey and in that dialogue, it, which may sound a bit tone deaf. I don't mean to. I think we're all concerned about the immediate right now, but that's that's what I'm looking ahead to, to wonder what's our role there. 
Claire. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that you bring up a really excellent point. You know, I think for me, the way that I've been sort of framing this in my head is that um, there's sort of like three broad parts to what we be, need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about how we're going to get through this and we need to think about how we're going to get out. <laughs> and then we're going to have to talk about, you know, how to get back and, and not back to the way it was, but back to something new. Right. So like getting us through include supporting organizations that may not be discussed like culture and arts. I think that that, that has to be um, part of the conversation because, um, you know, this is going to be a very, very long term crisis. And so how are we ensuring that all the various sectors that we support are, are going to make it through this um, crisis? Um, the getting it out um, really boils down to support for science. I think that that's the only way out of this mess is um, you know, the, the wrapping up of testing and tracing um, and, you know, the development of new therapeutics and vaccines. Uh, and I think that building that capacity in Canada is going to be extraordinarily important. Um, and, and that's really the only way out of this mess. So I, I think support there is, is going to be absolutely critical. Um, and then the getting back to some new, new normal, right? And I think that all of the points that you have made about um, the, the fact that this has not been an equalizer, this has been a revealer, and we see the inequalities that are in our society already and that are being exacerbated by this crisis. And, you know, people are talking about like, well, when are we get back to normal? When are we get back to normal? It, it seems clear that, you know, normal was not good <laughs> for a lot of people. And so what, what will the new normal look like and what role can we play in um, trying to make the, the new normal as, as fair and equitable as possible and, and, and use this as a, a as an opportunity, you know, it, it's, uh, it's sad that it took this kind of crisis to really get a lot of people to grapple with this reality, but um, that's what we're dealing with. And so um, let's let's use that to try to um, make a better um, system. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Conrad, where are the system and the, the current gaps? Well, I think all organizations that uh, normally are supported, I think all need core funds. I think this is the biggest challenge. Everybody wants to fund programs, but everybody's going to require some support in terms of core on the immediate. Uh, I think we have to see, and, and of course, the emergency funds to organizations are critical as well. Um, I'm not going to go too far, but I, I mentioned before the, uh, the recovery, which is going to be long term and uh, many needs. And we have to see where uh, funding, uh, government funding is going to land as well, because I think some initiatives that were more viewed as charitable might become part of main funding from governments as well, uh, main base funding, uh, because I think the needs are going to be so great. So adjusting to that, just want to remind everybody, if we weren't talking about COVID-19, we'd be talking about climate change and disasters, and we're heading into um, flood and fire season as well. Um, and we've seen larger impacts of that. Uh, hurricanes, uh, uh, fires, and floods don't know that it's COVID time and uh, they need to go on to other things. So we're going to be seeing the compounded challenge with many vulnerable people as well related to these things in the coming months. Thanks, thanks. So the, 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 uh, I, you're probably all aware of the um, initiative from Imagine Canada uh, supported by the uh, several federation and national uh, organizations such as uh, PFC and CFC um, to um, uh, try to convince the, liberal, the, the uh, federal government to set up a stabilization fund to support the charitable sector. Uh, and the first piece of that is the, the, the wage subsidies program for those that have experienced 30% uh, or more less of income, uh, which is uh, significant piece of, of, of the puzzle, but it still doesn't cover the core cost of operation and turning the lights on and, and, and paying the rent. And, and, uh, the, and, and for organizations that have lost so much on their, on their revenue side and fundraising, um, that they, there's, a, there's a massive gap to be, to be filled, not only by, 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 by government, by, uh, by Canadian corporation and the foundations to, uh, uh, to support that. So they, there's an effort uh, ongoing to try to convince the federal government to move on that right now. A move is something will come through, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it will require more lobbying from across the sector writ large uh, to get the, uh, to across the, 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 the red line on that. Um, we have time for perhaps one more round of, of uh, question and perhaps you can include your any closing comments that you have uh, 
uh, within that question, but what's next for philanthropy uh, to best support the Canadian and global response in the next month? And, but also, as Claire mentioned, this might be with us for the next couple of years. I, I, to go back to like, what's our role in the, in, in the, in the uh, emergency phase, the, the consolidating phase, and as, as the, the kind of recovery that might be multi-year, or Conrad mentioned five years at, at one point. Uh, the, 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 any ideas there to, to, uh, to try to, to deconstruct the, the, the the uh, what's, in what's, what's next in in our individual response and our and then a, a sectoral response to to for that we, what we need to look at to keep our eyes on and, and, and not not drop the ball on something significant moving forward. So um, uh, let me go around the uh, starting with Marcel and then we'll, we'll go and uh, get everybody else on the panel. Okay, I'm going to go very granular again because we've talked a lot about some of the bigger issues. But one thing that came up for me in terms of changes for Philanthropy Foundation is, is technology. Um, and very simply, um, the virtual stuff that we are currently doing makes me think about how we can govern ourselves as foundations much more in a much more nimble way. We can make decisions, I think, much more quickly if we work with technology. Of course, we'll hopefully do something good for the environment. But I also think it's a great way to connect. For a national foundation like ours, a great way to connect across the country with our grantees. Let's get rid of written reports and rather Zoom with our grantees and hear what, what they're all about, what their challenges are. So for me, that's a, a big learning coming out of this. Sorry, Claire? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one of the, I really uh, like Marcel's uh, pitch about this 5% ch challenge. That's the first I've heard of it. And I, and I think that that, um, that kind of philosophy is, is what's going to be needed from the philanthropic community. And I, I would challenge people to try to go beyond five <laughs> if possible, um, because I, I really think that we have a responsibility to act um, in, in more ex exceptional ways to, um, to, to get us through this and to help support the, um, the aftermath as well. Um, so I hope that um, community, or, uh, community foundations and, and private foundations, all the actors in this space um, are going to be willing to, to jump in and um, um, act in, in a bigger way than they're ordinarily inclined to do. Um, and, um, and again, like this idea of sort of deepening uh, collaboration uh, across sectors and across um, um, organizations, I think, is also necessary. Sharon. I totally agree with Claire and Marcel and will so I'll go in a totally different direction. I'm still looking for an impact investment opportunity through this crisis. Um, to Claire's point about getting as much money flowing out there as possible. I'm really hoping someone in this webinar is going to contact me afterwards and say we've got a way to um, pool uh, uh, money that would otherwise be in the market into some some um, recovery project or uh, or otherwise and so that's my plea um, I'm happy to go beyond the five percent and and definitely think it is time for all of us to be as generous and aggressive and nimble as possible but uh, I also would like to use all the tools in my toolkit so I'd love an impact investment opportunity somewhere in the next few months yeah, and and this is also an issue that we're going to be pursuing in some in, in our webinar Wednesday. Uh, I'm aware of a couple of foundations that are using their assets to uh, secure uh, loans for grantees. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, but not aware yet of people using their equity to make some investment at this time with uh, with with the grantees or kind of uh, so it's, it's something we need to go back to as as a community using all of our tools within our toolkits and some that tended to be on on. At the margin, at the edge of our, of the of the practice, whether or not they can become more mainstream. Um, the point, uh, Conrad. Maybe two things. One, just uh, again, we're going to be investing a lot of resources, and we're doing a lot of purchasing around the PP equipment for the community side. So anybody who wants to work in that field, happy to join us in that. We're getting our first shipment of seven hundred thousand uh, kits. Um, and of course, the training, which is going to be ongoing for uh, the next uh, the next years as well, and, and more a way of life. 
Um, I can't uh, not uh, be with the Red Cross and not end with saying that we have to think globally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to be a safer world if we don't work collectively, if we pull the drawbridge up and want to work all by ourselves, uh, it's not going to make it safer. So uh, how are we going to work with, of course, the most vulnerable also in the world um, in the uh, coming years and months is going to be critical. Otherwise, uh, we might as well all stay here, right? It's, uh, it's going to be a big challenge. So I think we have to keep that in mind as well uh, in terms of exporting know-how, technology, and also learning from other places that are doing a better job than us, actually. Right, thank you for that. I mean, to reminding us of that, the, 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 of the global nature of this crisis, and it still requires a global response. And our, our international institutions, have, have weak as they were, are even weaker now. And uh, and uh, and, and uh, that we need to that uh, to to get through this, uh, we need to re kind of reimagine uh, what international systems can look like at, at, in the ways that. Uh, uh, when you have uh, some parties uh, busy undermining what we what's, what's left of, of, of that structure, uh, and um, at the same time the, the, the point of learning from um, uh, what's happening elsewhere, the the this the, this platform, the database that we are are uh, trying to develop uh, with Grantbook is something that is in fact the uh, got inspired with uh, with uh, what's happening in Italy. And uh, they, 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 they uh, and, and and use some of of, of their way of connecting, uh, uh, getting the information, making it readily available to to use on the open platform. As they got inspired by the Italian examples, but surely we can learn from uh, from other pieces as well. So on on, on that note, we uh, we 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 have passed the the two the three o'clock uh, mark. I like to thank. All of our of our panelists this week, uh, Conrad, Marcel, Sharon, and Claire, for 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 your insights and uh, for their conversation here. And to remind everyone that uh, we do have another webinar Wednesday next week at two, and uh, it's uh, going to be on diversity, inclusion, and equity. So the question of, again of 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 how do we truly include the most and and address the needs of the most vulnerable amongst us. Uh, and uh, we have a, a panel of four people that are going to be uh, challenging uh, us to think differently in, in, our, in our work. So thanks again for all of you listening. Thanks again for your questions. Et uh, à la prochaine fois. Merci.